our first soft chalk lesson in unit one, lecture two, deals with the three domain system of classification. Let's start out again by looking at our fundamental station, uh, statements for this lesson. Phylogeny refers to the evolutionary relationship between organisms, where we classify organisms according to their evolutionary relationships. Organisms can be classified into one of three domains based on differences in the sequence of nucleotides in the cell's ribosomal RNAs or rRNAs, as well as their cell membrane lipid structure and their sensitivity to antibiotics. And with this system of uh, classification, there are three domains, the domain archaea, the domain bacteria, and the domain, uh, domain eukarya. Now, prokaryotic organisms belong either to the domain archaea or the domain bacteria. Any organism that has a eukaryotic cell belongs to the domain eukarya. So although there's three domains in nature, two of the three domains, as we'll see, are in fact prokaryotic organisms. And finally, we're gonna briefly mention that microorganisms transfer genes to other microorganisms through horizontal gene transfer. And this is the transfer of DNA to an organism that's not its offspring. We'll be taking that up in much more detail in Unit 2. And let's look at the detailed learning objectives for this lesson. Now, this is a very short soft chalk lesson with very few objectives you have to know. But you should be able to name the three domains in the three domain system of classification and recognize the description of each. Uh, you should be able to name the four kingdoms of the domain eukarya and recognize the description of each. And finally, you should be able to define horizontal gene transfer. So if we look at our bullet points and our detailed learning objectives, let's look at the content for this particular soft chalk lesson. Now the earth is thought to be about 4.6 billion years old and microbial life first appeared maybe 3.8 to 3.9 billion years ago. So for about 80% of the Earth's history, life was basically microbial life. And microbial life is still the dominant life form found on Earth. Now phylogeny refers to the evolutionary relationship between organisms and the three domain system that's currently used in classification is an evolutionary model and it's based primarily on differences in the sequence of nucleotides in the cell's ribosomal RNA or rRNA, the order of uh, adenine, guanine, cytosines, and uracils. It's also dependent on the cell's membrane lipid structure and the organism's sensitivity to antibiotics. Now what's primarily useful here is comparing the ribosomal RNA structure. Now we know that ribosomal RNA molecules throughout nature carry out the same function. And so their structure can change very little over time. This goes back to something we learned when we compared pro and eukaryotic cells when we talked about uh, the sedimentation rate of ribosomal subunits. Now remember the order of DNA nucleotides along a gene coding for ribosomal RNA gets transcribed into ribosomal RNA bases to form the rRNA molecule. But as we pointed out at that time, many of the ribosomal RNA nucleotides form intrastrand hydrogen bonds with other RNA nucleotides in the same strand, and that causes the ribosomal RNA molecule uh, to fold and assume a three-dimensional structure. And that structure is critical to function. So most mutations in the DNA that codes for ribosomal RNAs are pretty strict in terms of affecting uh, the function. Mutations in those, in many of those nucleotides would result in a different order of RNA nucleotides, and that could result in a different shape of the ribosomal RNA molecule. And in most cases, if the shape's altered, the function would be altered. And those cells would be selected against because they would have non-functional ribosomes. 
but not all of the RNA nucleotides along that ribosomal RNA molecule are critical to shape. So if mutations occur in some of those nucleotides that are not critical to shape, then the ribosome can still function. So the order of nucleotides in the rRNA, as we said, um, changes very little over time because most of those changes would result in non-functional ribosomes. But changes can occur uh, through mutation in some of the other nucleotides not responsible for shape, and that wouldn't affect the function. So over time, the order of nucleotides can change without affecting function, but uh, the chances of that happening are fairly small. So the overall idea here is that the similarities and dissimilarities in the RNA nucleotide sequence are a good indication of how related or unrelated different cells and organisms are. If two cells have a very similar order of RNA nucleotides in that ribosomal RNA, then chances are they uh, haven't separated from one another very far in terms of evolution, uh, there's very few differences. But if there's a substantial difference in the order of RNA nucleotides, that meant that much more time has occurred that allowed these non-critical mutations to occur. And so those cells uh, and those organisms are less related. Now, there are a number of hypotheses as to the origin of pro- and eukaryotic cells. Some of them are listed here. Uh, but you don't have to worry too much about the hypotheses. What we want to get at here is that there are now, we consider three distinct domains of organisms in nature, the domain bacteria, the domain archaea, and the domain eukarya. And we're going to look, now look at a description of each of these three. So our first domain is the domain archaea. These were formerly called archaebacteria. And here's some of their characteristics. Like the domain bacteria, the archaea are prokaryotic cells. But unlike the domain bacteria and the domain eukarya, the archaea uh, have membrane phospholipids composed of branched hydro hydrocarbon chains that attach um, to glycerol by ether linkages. And we can see that in figure one here. So we see that in figure one, uh, the membrane lipids found in the domain bacteria and eukarya are very similar. These two fatty acid chains here in figure one coming off the glycerol are what we call uh, non-branched carbon chains. There's no carbon chains coming off of this. And what connects the uh, two fatty acids to the glycerol is what's called an ester link, which we see right here. However, the membrane lipids of the domain archaea, as we see in the bottom part of figure one, we see that the um, fatty acids coming off the glycerol have branched carbons coming off, so they have a branched hydrocarbon chain coming off. And what connects the fatty acids to the glycerol in this case is a different linkage called an ether link rather than an ester link. So archaea have their own unique membrane lipids, distinct from that found in both the bacteria and the eukarya. Also, the cell walls of the archaea don't contain peptidoglycan, whereas the domain bacteria, with a few exceptions, have peptidoglycan, uh, and the eukarya never have peptidoglycan either, as we'll see. The domain archaea are not sensitive to some of the antibiotics that affect the domain bacteria, but they are sensitive to some of the antibiotics that affect eukarya. But the main difference, again, is that the ribosomal RNA found in the archaea has a unique nucleotide sequence uh, unique to the archaea. Uh, you might think that the archaea ribosomal RNAs being prokaryotic would be more similar to the bacteria our RNAs also being prokaryotic, but they aren't. The archaea ribosomal RNAs are just as distinct from the bacteria ribosomal RNAs as they are the eukarya ribosomal RNAs. So they make up their own unique domain.
Now, many of these archaea live in very extreme environments. There's various groups of these like methanogens that give off methane gas with their metabolism, extreme halophils that grow at very high salt concentrations, and hypothermophils that grow at very high temperatures. And one of the reasons the archaea are thought to be able to withstand some of these harsh environments is that uh, the ether linkage in their membranes is more stable than the ester linkage found in the domain bacteria in eukarya. So a lot of these archaea can withstand very harsh environments, but also archaea grow in uh, everyday environments. They're found throughout nature. Now our second domain is the domain bacteria, formerly called eubacteria. Like the domain archaea, the domain bacteria are prokaryotic cells. Like the eukarya, they have membranes composed of unbranched fatty acid chains attached to glycerol by ester linkages, as we saw up here in figure one. They have a phospholipid similar to that of the eukarya, but distinct from that of the archaea. The cell walls of the bacteria, unlike the cell walls of archaea and the eukarya that have cell walls, typically contains peptidoglycan. The domain bacteria are sensitive to traditional antibiotics that we use to treat bacterial infections, but are resistant to most antibiotics that affect eukarya, unlike, again, the domain archaea. And again, the main difference is the bacteria have unique ribosomal RNAs distinct to that domain. Uh, they're no similar to the archaea or the eukarya. They're all very distinct. And the domain bacteria include bacteria like the mycoplasmas, the only bacteria that actually lack a cell wall, the cyanobacteria, which carry out photosynthesis, and then the bacteria we'll take up during this course, the gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And our final domain is the domain eukarya, which are eukaryotic cells. So these have eukaryotic cell structure. They have membrane lipids similar to the domain bacteria, the unbranched fatty acid chains attached to glycerol by ester links. Not all the eukarya have a cell wall, but if they do have a cell wall, they never contain peptidoglycan. That's unique to the domain bacteria. The eukarya are resistant to traditional antibacterial antibiotics but are sensitive to most antibiotics that affect eukaryotic cells. And again, the eukarya have their own unique ribosomal RNAs. The nucleotide sequence of the ribosomal RNAs in the domain eukarya are distinctly different from that found in the archaea and the bacteria. And the domain eukarya can be divided into a number of kingdoms. So the first kingdom is the kingdom protista, and these are simple, predominantly unicellular eukaryotic organisms. They include things like slime molds, euglenoids, algae, and protozoa. The fungi have their own kingdom. These are either unicellular or multicellular organisms that have eukaryotic cell types. They do have cell walls, but they're not, the cells are not organized into tissues. Although they look kind of like plants, they carry out no photosynthesis and they obtain nutrients through absorption. So these include things like sac fungi, club fungi or mushrooms, yeasts, and molds. Plants have their own kingdom, the plantae kingdom. These are multicellular organisms, again, composed of eukaryotic cells, and the cells are organized into tissues and the cells do have cell walls. Plant cells do have a cell wall, remember. They obtain nutrients through photosynthesis and absorption, and that include things like mosses, ferns, conifers, and flowering plants. And the final kingdom is the animalia kingdom. Animals are also, of course, multicellular organisms composed of eukaryotic cells. The cells are organized into tissues, but animal cells lack a cell wall. They're surrounded simply by a plasma membrane. Of course, they carry out no photosynthesis and they obtain nutrients primarily by ingestion. And that would include things like sponges, worms, insects, and vertebrates.
Now, it used to be thought that changes that allow microbes, to, uh, that allow organisms to adapt to new environments or alter their virulence was a relatively slow process that occurred through mutation, chromosomal rearrangements, gene deletions, gene duplications, things that occurred within that cell. And that these changes, such as a mutation change as a result of mutation, would be passed on to their progeny, and then natural selection would determine whether that change would be beneficial or non-beneficial and would influence whether or not that organism survived. So this type of gene transfer, where there's a gene transfer from a parent organism to its offspring, is called vertical gene transmission. So every time a cell divides, that would be vertical gene transmission. But we now know that microbial genes are transferred not only vertically uh, from a parent to its progeny, but also horizontally to relatives that uh, may be distantly related to other species or even other genera. So we call this horizontal gene transfer, the transfer of genes to organisms that are not their offspring. And three of the terms you learned on your take home exam uh, reviewing. Uh, molecular genetics from biology introduce these three terms that we'll take up later on in unit two when we discuss horizontal gene transfer. Uh, but uh, horizontal gene transfer involves processes like transformation, the transfer of DNA from a dead degraded bacterium to a living competent bacterium, transduction where bacterial genes are transferred from one bacterium to another by a virus. And finally, conjugation, where genes are transferred from one bacterium to another by direct contact through the process of conjugation. And again, in unit two, we're going to take this up in detail, but we wanted to introduce these terms early on since uh, horizontal gene transfer is going to be very important in the ability of microorganisms to adapt to environments. So we know that microbes live in a very, very diverse environments sometimes even extremely harsh environments. And this very rapid adaptability is a result of, of being able to modify their protein functions by modifying, gaining, or losing genes primarily through horizontal gene transfer. So again, that's where an organism incorporates genetic material from another organism without being the offspring of that organism. Now mutation and the other mechanisms also play a role in adapting, but much more what gives them the ability to adapt so readily to new environments is horizontal gene transfer. So that's a brief look at the three domain system. Again, a fairly short soft chalk lesson, not very many objectives you have to know on this. And there's a little self check you can do to uh, see how well you understand this.